like to use everything in the kitchen. For me, the indication of a good chef, Chinese, French, Italian, uh, Spanish, male, female, doesn't make any difference, is the use often of leftover or using everything in the kitchen. And today, that's what we're going to do. Uh, here, I have peas, and as you see, those peas, we're going to use them in one of our dish, and I just washed them before. And what we do is to remove the pea, the fresh pea, from the pad, and the pad here, I'm going to use that in a soup. Show you the thrifty nest in the kitchen. I have about 12 ounces of, uh, of peas, and that we're going to use that later. In the recipe also, we are using a leek. And as you can see, I cleaned that leek here. The end of the green, the end of the green here and there, but basically I don't remove much. You know, it is not a good idea to cut everything off and discard this. And even the few peas that I discard, which are too tough, I keep that for stock. So we do use everything. So what we want to do first is to cut that, uh, that leek, and it really doesn't matter how coarsely you want to cut it here because we are going to strain it anyway. We're going to put that in a food mill. So I put that into that pot with a tablespoon of, uh, of butter, of uh, oil rather, and I use here a canola type of oil, which is a polyunsaturated type of oil. And I have onion also, I have an onion. And I like, you know, when I do a soup, to stew the vegetable a little bit before I put the liquid in it. Then a potato. The potato is going to be the binding agent here. And you can, again, cut them any way you want. See, I can peel the potato ahead, providing I keep them in water. But when I take them out of the water, I don't like to rewash them because it takes too much of the starch out of it. What I want to do is to saute that first a little bit and put our potato. And again, another fallacy about uh, soup, you know, is that you have to use stock. I use water. And I like, especially with vegetable, to use water because I really have the taste of the, the vegetable closer to the way it should be. So water is perfectly fine. And soup doesn't have to take hours to cook either. You know, it cooks pretty fast. Put a dash of salt in this. And I put my pea pad, which is going to cook. Of course, uh, you have to realize that this is going to melt kind of down, you know? You have to realize that if you use your pea pad, then I have one cooked here. You cannot put your soup in a food processor. If you put the soup in a food processor, you're going to have all of those fiber, you know, in the pea pad that you cannot really use. So what you have to do is to put it through a food mill that I have started here, that type of food mill, you know, with little hole and different blade. You can push things through and the fiber will remain there. So that's what I have here, you know. This is really home cooking. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I had to choose one dish out of all the dish that I eat all the time, if I was on an island and having to choose one dish, I would pick up a soup. And probably a soup with potato and leek. That's what I like the best. So this, here we strain this. There is, you can go back and forth with this, you know. And basically, you see what will remain is the fiber here, those little pieces from the pad, you know. I'm going to bring that underneath. And our soup here could be served as such. If you want to have it slightly richer, I put it back in there, you know, with maybe a tablespoon of butter. If you want to splurge a little bit, right there. You can do that at the last moment. You know, if we use butter, we use, of course, only unsalted butter. And in our show, very little. You know, uh, those soup used to be finished with a lot of heavy cream and the butter. We'll put maybe a little piece, but at the end, when you get maximum taste out of it. I have a nice thick soup here, and of course, I would serve that maybe with some crouton, a bit of chives on top. This is a very satisfying type of uh, first course for me. Soup is always welcome uh, in any type of dish. And here, what we're going to do is to put a little bit of chives on top, and you know, frankly, the crouton could be also put on top or around. If you put the crouton on top, do it at the last moment because you don't want them to get soggy. You want them to be like this. And this is our first course for a very thrifty dinner. We use, you know, the beans in the summer, but summer for me is also beans and peas, you know. All of it in my garden usually. And here I have a whole array of different dry 
and the fresh peas. I have those dry pinto beans here, and when they are really fresh, they cook very fast in like 30 minutes. Here I have the string beans, you know, and those string beans, when I was a kid, we really used to string them. There is no string anymore, so you can take only the end part of it, and sometimes even that part, which is a bit tougher. The snow peas here have to be stringed on one side, at least this side, and take the end off here. Sometimes there is a string also. Those are snap peas, and snap peas, you know, have those peas inside. But you eat the whole thing, but you have to string it on this side and again around on the other side. And this is terrific, you know. And finally here, we have those large ones, which are fava beans, you know. And those fava beans, are, you see, are quite large, very cotton inside. You really cannot use the shell, but this is good. Now, a lot of people cook it this way. It's even better if you take the shell out of it. It's difficult to take, so what you do, you drop that in boiling water, boil it one second, and I have them here, and after that, you just make a little hole here and press it out. You see, it will pop out. So you make a little hole and press it out like this. You do the same thing with lima bean, and those now are really tender and nice. Just blanch this way. And finally, here we have our regular peas, which we are going to use today. You know, those... Uh, Please remember that we use those pads here for our soup. And now we're going to use this with our stew that we have here. And the first thing we're going to do there is to saute a little bit of onion and some scallion here. We start our stew this way, you know, a stew of peas. Uh, really type of home cooking which I love because it's flavored with a little bit of ham, but not much of it. So what we do, a bit of onion, again, that we want to chop fairly coarsely, you know, again, across. All that come from the garden, you know? It's always nice to go to the garden and cook. But I tell you, it is good. One of the only vegetables that I use uh, frozen is the peas, the tiny baby peas, you know, and frozen they are good. I'll tell you why, unless you have a garden and have them very fresh, the sugar in them tend to st turn into starch pretty fast, you know, so the frozen peas are acceptable and quite good for me. Remember that the peas are very, very high in protein. The legume, they are a leguminous and actually so high in protein, about three times as much as regular as most vegetable, you know, so this is nice. What we are going to do here in the old style, or old style of cooking if you want, or home style of cooking, to saute, you see the onion with, uh, with a bit of uh, scallion. I put a little piece of butter in this one. And with that, we're going to do what we call a roux. That is a mixture. Oh, those onions are strong. A little bit of flour, and I have about one and a half, two teaspoons of flour. You spread it on top of the mixture. This is a technique we call singer in French. That is to singe, to spread out your flour here. And again, remember when we use a starch, we dilute the starch with liquid. Otherwise the protein set and it form lump. Likewise here, when you do a roux, actually the butter does the same thing. It spread out the segment of the flour and prevent it from lumping on you. Then you can cook it for a minute or so. Then we put liquid. In that time, we just put water here, you know, and that amount of flour, I have about a teaspoon and a half here, will just give me something slightly nice and syrupy. I'm going to stir it until it's all melted. And basically, that's what you want to do now. I put my carrot to do the stew. And we want to bring that, oh, and a little bit of the herb de Provence. I prepare herb de Provence, that mixture of different herb with oregano. I even have lavender flowers in there. I want to bring that to a boil and cook that for a few minutes. Then we'll add the peas, and finally, at the end, a little bit of that ham, which is used as a flavoring agent, which if you don't want to use, you can omit. With that type of uh, simple stew of vegetable, you know, which is often what we had at the main course when I was a kid, we're going to have a steak, but very inexpensive steak. What we call in France, le steak du boucher, butcher steak, you know? And those are unknown or not very well known cut and very good and as I say inexpensive and those very lean. This is the shoulder blade steak. You will recognize it because inside you have that long, narrow strip, very gelatinous. We call it in New York and on the West Coast also, I think this is called chicken steak, you know. 
Small steak like that or three, four ounces is terrific. We have a steak probably unknown here, which is in the cavity of the pelvis bone. We call that the oyster steak, like the oyster in the chicken, you know, there in the cavity. Usually that, the butcher eat it. Then we have that long, narrow thing that now people do fajita with, and this is the skirt steak. It's inside the cavity of the animal. It, it's actually the, the breathing apparatus, you know, the plexus solarium there. So you have a large muscle on each side. Skirt steak. This is what they use now for fajita or those type of Mexican uh, dish which are very good. This is a great steak we call longle in France. And again, in the center of the animal, in between the ribs, there is a hanging piece of meat like this. This is what is called the hanging tenderloin. In France, longle is considered one of the best steak. Again, there is that large muscle in the center. Notice that most of those steaks, not the skirt steak, but the other one, are going to be very, very lean and juicy, you know? Finally, what we use today is that piece of meat, which is from the hip, and that piece of meat from the hip, as you see, it's a bit the shape of a triangle, and we call it the triangle steak. Again, very, very lean, and I can cut it thin, you know, like this, to cut a steak of approximately, uh, you know, five ounces, if I do it thin. It's barely five ounces this way, a very lean piece of meat. And I'm going to cook two steaks. What you would want to do, you know, is just simply put a bit of salt and pepper on top of this, on each side. Now, you don't put salt on top of a piece of meat until you're ready to use it, because the salt will tend to draw out the moisture, you know? And that's often what people say, do you salt meat before? Yes, it is true that the salt will draw out the moisture. The point is, however, that it's going to take like a couple of hours before it draws out the moisture, so there is nothing wrong in putting a little bit of salt just before you cook it. If you prefer not to put the salt on top, it's fine also. It has a different taste, but the salt at the end of cooking doesn't go into it the same way. I think that we can put that to cook now in our grill, you know, this way, very thin steak. And I think we should be close to ready to put our peas, you know. Remember that we have here, all we have here was our carrot and the peas. So we have a lot of beautiful color. And again, the fresh peas will take about seven, eight minutes to cook. Finally, we are going to put the ham in it. But for the time being, before doing this, I want to show you how to make what we call a maitre d' butter, a beurre maitre d'hôtel, we call it in France. And this is a seasoning butter. In modern cooking, you know, a lot what we do to replace what we used to do, Hollandaise, Bearness sauce and so forth. I have one finish here. You can freeze it, put it in a piece of plastic wrap. When you're ready to use it, you know, we cut it into pieces like this. Of course, take the paper from around it. And we keep that in ice. You know, very often in restaurants, and you will put a little piece, like half a tablespoon of butter on top of a steak, and you'll have all the flavor that you need. And, you know, a tablespoon of butter with the seasoning in it is about, it's about 100 calories, so it's not that much. You see, my steak now has to be turned this way. As you can see, it will be marked nicely, depending how rare you want it. It's going to be cooked soon. What I have here is two tablespoons of butter that I'm going to put in there. And lemon juice, like a tablespoon of lemon juice we want to put on top of it here. You know, again, you know, unsalted sweet butter, that's what we do, the beurre met d'hôtel. You can do a tarragon butter, then you will have tarragon, of course. But here, the beurre met d'hôtel would be lemon juice and uh, parsley, you know. And this is the curly parsley, you know, which I'm going to cut just coarsely here to put in there with the lemon juice. This is an ideal little uh, uh, machine, you know, to ground uh, herb very finely. That goes on top, and finally, that piece should make it firm here. Okay, the butter has to be fairly soft, you know, to work well. And we can put a little more, let me test, maybe a little more lemon juice in there. Will do well. Here we are. You know, it depends, you know, sometimes during the summer I go through the garden and do an herb butter, take six, dif seven different types of, uh, of herb, you know. And basically that mixture here, you can now use it as is, or you can put it 
what I did here, roll it and keep it in your refrigerator. But it is a great flavor. So what we'll do here, maybe I'll leave it directly in there because I may use the cold one, which is going to work better on the steak. So now let's see. Our steak should be close to ready. Yeah. I can mark it on both sides, but when you do small steak like this, one side is enough. They cook a couple of minutes on each side if you want it relatively rare, you know. And again, it's a question of taste, you know. Now my peas here, see, this is a beautiful stew of peas. Very often, when I was a kid, my mother would do that as a dish by itself. That is, as the main course of the meal, you know. And what she would do, I'm putting uh, uh, ham in there, you know but she would use leftover meat. Like if you do a roast of veal, chicken, whatever, then she would start it with little pieces of the leftover meat to use other flavoring agent. Again, a thrifty way of cooking. And we're going to present that on this, you know. You will want to put, again, you know, don't worry, when you do that type of presentation, you put always things in the middle, then out, then spread out with your fork to make a kind of nest. And on top of this, I have my steak here, small steak right in the center of it. And my little piece of beurre met d'hôtel. And this is our main course for today. And let's make our dessert now. Some people think it's the best part of the meal, the dessert, you know. When in nut, when in doubt, start with dessert, people say. So what we have here is plum. Beautiful Santa Rosa plum. What you want is uh, any type of plum, but other fruit will work quite well also. What's important with fruit is really that it's ripe. That will determine the amount of uh, sugar that you put in it and all of this. Makes a big difference between, you know, if you have a pear which is really hard and unripe and something which is really ripe. So here we cut them, we quarter those. Santa Rosa, you can use all the type of uh, plum, one way or the other. We take the pit out of it, and we do a type of uh, stew, you know, with it. I put a little, uh, uh, like about one teaspoon and a half of butter, not too much, you know, here. And with that, we are going to put the plum to saute them. They're going to get soft, you know, of course, they're going to get soft and render some liquid. Then we put beautiful nuts. Here are those pistachio nuts. Even the color there is really striking. A dash of water, you know, to stop the moisture. And our sweetening agent, you know, I'm putting some apricot jam in there. Okay, we mix that together. And you know, we're going to do other things to it, but frankly, you could do this and serve that in a nice glass bowl with a little bit of cream, a little bit of yogurt, or by itself, or with a cookie, be a great dessert by itself. So what we have here, that should cook, and I have one here which is already cooked after five, six minutes of cooking. And this is what we are going to do now with it. We're going to put that in the little ram can here, you know, to fill it up. Those are nice, and uh, you could you know, even do a type of uh, custard with that. Uh, that is putting it this way, and with a little bit of custard on top or cream, fill them up, you know. This is about half a cup ramekin, you know. So maybe I'll fill up those three here to show you. And what we want to do in top is filo dough, and the filo dough is that type of dough made with water and flour, those thin, very thin. And as you can see, I had a wet towel on top, because if you don't have that wet towel on top, it's going to dry out. So what we do, we want to do a hat with that. Brush that very lightly with butter, you know. We use about uh, one good tablespoon, one and a half tablespoon of uh, butter for four sheet. Sprinkle with a little bit of uh, powdered sugar on top. And then with that, we want to put the butter and the sugar on the outside and form a kind of hat, you know, very loose on top of it that we put like a handkerchief, you know, like this. As you can see, it's quite easy and it makes a striking uh, thing that, you know, those sheets of uh, phyllo used to be difficult to get. Now you can get that very easily, basically, in all market. You know, you do all kind of order with it. The classic way 
is stuffed with spinach in the Greek manner too, but look at that here. You can do it that open or then the other way. This way doesn't matter. What you don't want to do, you don't want to, you know, squeeze it very tight into a bowl where the dough is going to get together. You want to have some sp space in between so that it can brown nicely in the oven, you know? And I have it here. Okay, gathering it gently. And that's it. And this now, you want to put in the oven around 350, 375 degree oven. Uh, it's going to cook. You want to serve that kind of lukewarm, you know? I have some which are ready here. And the dough, as you can see, is going to get very crisp and on. And this makes, of course, a very nice presentation. You know, very striking, a bit unusual. Those are still warm, but as I say, you would want to serve that basically lukewarm. And that very, you see, you can hear it very crunchy and all that, and that's how you want it. Eat that with a little spoon. You can serve that just by itself here. A bit hot. You can even put, if you want, a tiny bit of powdered sugar on top to give it more flair even, you know, sometimes in modern cuisine, they even decorate the plate with powdered sugar or cocoa, you know, to give a different effect. And this is our beautiful dessert for our menu. One of the greatest meals I ever had in my life We are done with very inexpensive ingredients. So sometimes, you know, people think that they do have to spend a great deal of money to make a good meal. And sometimes it's good to have caviar without any question. But very often at home, you know, you can recognize a good cook in what he does in the kitchen by using everything. This is what I call good cooking, and I'm very impressed when I go to a kitchen and see someone who can use a chicken and use the bone and use the neck and use the, the skin and use the meat and so forth. I know that person has knowledge of cooking. That's a bit what we did in our menu today, especially with our pipad soup. Uh, we use leek uh, and, of course, onion and the potato, but the pipad is a nice addition to it. It has a nice, fun taste. That soup is served hot as we have it with some crouton, a bit of herb. If you want to splurge, you could even finish it with cream. Or you could put some milk in it if you want and serve it cold with some chive, just like a vichyssoise, you know, one of those cold soups that you have in summer. It's quite good. Then we have our little steak. Remember, this is not a sirloin or a filet mignon. It is from the hip part of the animal. It's a very lean steak. It's a small one. It's about four or five ounces with that beautiful stew of peas, you know, which could be served at a main course by itself. And that would be very nice. We also have a salad. And finally, the beautiful dessert with the phyllo cap. You know, the phyllo is made of water and flour. And except for a little bit of butter that I put in it, uh, those sheets of phyllo are less than one ounce, so it's not that much. And it truly really dresses it up. You could do it, of course, with raspberry or other type of fruit. And if you don't want to put the cap on top, you can serve it just plain on a stew, as we have it here. And that will be terrific, too. And with that stew, I would serve a good glass of wine. Today, we have a Pinot Noir, a Pinot Noir from the Sonoma County, you know, a very rich, complex, and very delicious and fruity wine. And I will enjoy it with my meal. I hope you do that meal for your friend and save a bit of money in the kitchen. You will enjoy eating the meat as much as I will eating that meal now. I enjoy cooking it for you. Happy cooking. <laughs>